Om Sahana Vavatu Sahano Bunaktu Sahavir Yang Karavai Tejas Vinam Aditamastu Mavid Vishavai Om Shanti 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 Om May the Divine Being look over us lovingly as a mother and father. May the Divine Being support and nourish us as a mother and father. May we have the strength and skill to study together the art of spirituality. May no misunderstandings arise amongst us. Om peace, peace. Peace and beneficence be unto us and to all, be all beloved beings everywhere. So good morning and welcome everyone. Namaste. Some announcements. As many of you already know, we lost one of our stalwarts, one of the guardians and promoters of this center, promoter of the welfare of this center on Tuesday of last week. Thomas Jefferson Couch, Tom Couch, left the body at about 7 a.m. last Tuesday in the ICU of Piedmont Hospital here in Atlanta. He was 84 years old, had been in reasonably good health. The immediate cause of death was listed as bacterial pneumonia, but he had suffered a very, very bad fall that had resulted in a six hour procedure to correct some internal bleeding and so for 11 or so days, he was, he would rally and then falter, as his sister said. Finally, the bacterial pneumonia took his life, apparently. When I say he was a stalwart and a leader here, that goes back more than 30 years. Uh, he was one of the earlier disciples of Swami Yogeshananda and uh, very early on became a part of the leadership of this center. He is survived by his wife of 24 years, Iris Couch, and a large extended family of siblings, of in-laws, of children and grandchildren, all of whom say they're missing him already very much, and many of whom were with him in the room when he left the body. So fare thee well, Tom Couch. All of Mother's blessings are no doubt with you in full. For those of you who would like to talk about this at all, if you'd like to stay after the talk, uh, we, we can do that. I'm not saying we should, but uh, anyone who wishes to talk about it, uh, you're welcome to stay after the talk and uh, we'll, we'll talk about Tom, his life and his service here. The second announcement is that Along with the talks, classes have resumed. We started on Saturday, and so the Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday classes will begin next week, tomorrow, uh, as, as usual. Also, I'm sorry to con have to report that we're continuing in lockdown mode. Uh, we are not having any uh, in-person gatherings. Uh, that. Chapel, of course, and bookshop are open for 
uh, all day long, seven days a week. So you're welcome to visit. And if you would like an appointment to visit uh, with me, all you have to do is send me an email or call, and we'll arrange that. That's, that's altogether possible also. So before I move on, uh, is there any other announcement that might have been made that was neglected? Did you mention the, um, oh, well, I, the reading for tomorrow? Oh, reading. thank you, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we just received a confirmation that there will be a la Labor Day tomorrow, Monday, reading of the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. We'll send out a bulletin this afternoon, but essentially uh, you may read anywhere in the gospel that you like. Uh, the, in, in Hollywood, they organize it so that <clears throat> the entirety of the gospel is read. So we don't need to be organized in our way of going about it, is what Swami Sarvadevananda says in his letter, which will be sent as part of this bulletin. Um, and if any of you would like uh, a recommendation as to where you might read usefully, I'll put a note to that effect in the bulletin. Thank you, Cindy. Shankara? Yes, dear. Do people need to be vaccinated to meditate in the chapel or? or oh, absolutely. Come see you. Yeah, ab okay. they have to be fully vaccinated. And uh, yeah, that's, that's, okay. that's a fact. We're, we're just not having any anyone on the premises who is not fully vaccinated. So I'm going to start with a song. I'm not in the best of voice, but uh, <clears throat> we'll do the best we can. You'll see how this relates to the talk. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. We are climbing Jacob's ladder, children of her love. Every rung goes higher, higher. Every rung goes higher, higher. Every rung goes higher, higher. Children of her love. Children do you want your freedom? Children, do you want your freedom? Children, do you want your freedom? Children of her love. Keep on climbing, you will make it. Keep on climbing, you will make it. Keep on climbing, you will make it. Children of her love. She is waiting to take your hand, yes. She is waiting to take your hand, yes. She is waiting to take your hand, children of her love. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. We are climbing Jacob's ladder, children of his love. Every rung goes higher, higher. Every rung goes higher, higher. Every rung goes higher, higher. Children of his love. Children, do you want your freedom? Children, do you want your freedom? Children, do you want your freedom, children of his love. Keep on climbing, you will make it. Keep on climbing, you will make it. Keep on climbing, you will make it, children of his love. He is waiting to take your hand, yes. He is waiting to take your hand, yes. He is waiting to take your hand, children of his love. Children 
of her love, children of their love. Om Amen. For those of you who are not familiar with the symbolism of Jacob's Ladder, it is the human spine and the spiritual centers therein. So that's Jacob's Ladder. <clears throat> September is a month for study of Raja Yoga, a spiritual path often called the Yoga of Meditation. As a Raja Yogi, you use ancient, proven spiritual techniques to calm your body, quiet your mind, and gain control of your attention. Regular daily practice of Raja Yoga increases your ability to concentrate and may lead to meditation. This can unite you with the Divine Presence, Atman, the source of your being, and liberate you from the painful cycle of rebirth and death. Raja Yoga is said to be able to liberate you from the painful cycle of rebirth and death. It is the eighth limb of Patanjali's yoga. Now, as I say each week, this is not meant as personal instruction. You take from it what, if anything, you find useful. Nothing is intended as personal instruction and certainly it is not dogma or ultimate truth. It is what is understood from here and thereby communicated. That's all. So please receive it in that spirit and use, as I say, anything from it that appeals to you. The topic this morning is you can't win if you don't play. You can't win if you don't play. The Upanishads say that you live in the karmi bhuma, bhumi, in the karma bhumi. You live in the karma bhumi, a realm or world of action. Karma, action, bhumi, realm or world. We live in that realm. According to Sri Krishna, the body that is now home to your spirit, Atman, is the field of action. You learn and grow by doing, Krishna repeats again and again. So your body is the field field of action. The knower is the Atman, and you learn and grow and liberate the Atman from entanglement by doing, Sri Krishna repeats again and again. In spite of all this, it's remarkable how many of us act as if Shravana and Manana, hearing and thinking about the truth, our effort enough. We somehow do not grasp what Sri Ramakrishna means when he insists, yes, knowing spiritual truths is fine, but you must assimilate them to get their benefits. In this context, assimilate means being, it means to digest and make useful to the body and mind in action. Assimilate means, in this context, to digest and make useful to the body and mind in action. It is spiritual food. This morning, within the framework of the sage Patanjali's Raja Yoga, we will explore the statement, you can't win 
if you don't play. We will define and discuss who you are, what it means to win as a Raja Yogi, and how that Yogi plays the game of life to achieve her final victory. To begin, let's review the definition of this spiritual path. Point one, Raja Yoga is often called the Yoga of Meditation. Raja means king. So Raja Yoga is the king of yogas and the yoga of spiritual queens and kings. That's the meaning of Raja Yoga. As a Raja Yogi, as a Raja Yogi, you use ancient, proven spiritual techniques. Patanjali organized these ages-old methods into his eight limbs of yoga, yamas, niyamas, asana, pranayama, pratyahara, dharana, dhyana, samadhi. So we'll discuss those a little bit later. Their purposes, the purposes of these eight limbs of yoga, particularly the first six, as we'll see, their purposes are to calm your body, quiet your mind, and gain control of your attention. Doing what Patanjali says will yield those results. Regular daily practice of Raja Yoga increases your ability to concentrate. Now, most of us think we know how to concentrate because we can follow a recipe or follow the instructions for assembling something that we bought at IKEA. That's a form of concentration, no doubt, but it is not the one-pointedness of mind that Patanjali means by the word concentration. He means being able to hold one thought, image, sound, whatever it is that you're meditating on, hold that to the exclusion of everything else for a period of time. <clears throat> and he defines concentration as beginning when you can do that for 12 seconds, when you can hold one thought, one image, one sound, one mantra in your mind for 12 seconds without interruption. That is the beginning of concentration. Concentration may lead to meditation. Meditation, according to Pantanjali, is defined as the ability to concentrate for 12 times 12 seconds or two minutes 24 seconds. This is a monumental feat. It is very difficult and takes years of practice for most people. But as Swami Vivekananda points out, what, what else could be worth the effort? What could be more fruitful than freedom? and true happiness. And meditation can lead to that. Meditation can unite you with the divine presence, Atman, the source of your being and the source of all freedom and happiness. This state of unity is beyond all desires and attachments. This state of unity is beyond all desires and attachment. In this state of self-realization, you are liberated from the cycle of rebirth and death. That cycle is the source of all enjoyment and all suffering. By enjoyment, we do not mean happiness. We mean temporary enjoyment or transitory bliss at best. So this meditation 
can lead to liberation. Liberation means freedom from all limitation. Liberation means freedom from all limitation. You become, according to the yogis, you become kaivalya, independent, not conditioned in any way, not dependent on anything. Now that is worth some contemplation all by itself. This liberation means freedom from all limitations, independent of all conditioning and dependence. All of what has been said, all of what has been said so far, is the testimony of the scriptures, the divine incarnations, and their saints. These sources also say, you can't win if you don't play. So what do we mean by you win and play? You means the Atman and the person it has created using the Gunas and Samkhya's 24 cosmic principles. This is what Krishna tells us in the Gita. And it's also said in the in the Upanishads that the Atman, the divine presence, has created this very being, this very stardust spacesuit. And according to Sankhya, which is the basis of Patanjali's Raj, Raja Yoga, according to that, it is the, the instruments for doing this are the three gunas tamas, rajas, and sattva, and the 24 cosmic principles. We'll go into the 24 cosmic principles in another time. Sri Ramakrishna says, as long as you, the Atman with attributes, retain a sense of I consciousness and are therefore capable of self-effort, as long as you retain that sense of I am as a separate being, that's I consciousness. As long as you retain this I consciousness and are therefore capable of self-effort, you are responsible for your actions and their outcomes. So that's the you of you can't win if you don't play. What does win mean? Win means attain a lower form of samadhi. Win means attain a lower form of samadhi, which Patanjali calls nivichara, with seeds. With seeds. This lower form of samadhi is not the final victory, but it is close. Desire and attachment remain in seed form, yet the purified mind capable of this samadhi is no longer drawn to desire and attachment. In this state of awareness, liberation is said to be near. This is was affirmed again and again by my teacher, Swami Prabhupada. He said, you're just a hair's breadth away when you have attained uh, the ability to concentrate. But your progress is no longer, but your progress beyond this point is no longer a matter of self-effort. Patanjali says that the higher forms of samadhi and liberation are something that happens to you. Something that happens to you. Your I consciousness, while present, is very different, what Ramakrishna calls the ripe ego, no longer drawn to those things of self-interestedness and in no way capable of being harmful to itself, its own stardust spacesuit, 
or to others. This is the ripe ego. And this is what mean, it means to win, to attain that state. Play, play, you can't win if you don't play. What does play mean? Play means living a life of very deliberate actions that lead to purification of the body and mind. Play means living a life of very deliberate actions that lead to purification of the body and mind. As a Raja Yogi, you organize your daily life and your priorities in such a way that you can actively pursue the first six limbs of Patanjali's yoga. Yama, Niyama, Asana pranayama, pratyahara, and dhyana. <clears throat> Increasingly, your body is calm, your mind is quiet, and your attention is under your control. Victory is near. So before we go on to discuss those first six limbs and mention the last two. Uh, is there anything in the way of a contribution from your own wisdom or, or experience about this or anything that you would like to ask or any concern that you would like to raise? This is studying together. Um, I'm going to jump in real quick and say that it's it's interesting how um, we'll read these things and talk about them for years and we'll talk about them again and again and then suddenly you hear something that you've heard before but you hear it <laughs> this time right. um, and when you said the part about as long as you have some awareness of yourself as can't remember the exact words separate me separate being, you are responsible for your actions and your, you know, sometimes we've confused, you know, well, if I'm not the doer, then I'm not doing any of this. But that's only when you've reached a state of not being aware of yourself as a separate being. Have, have Pre I got that? Precisely. Okay, that's, Precisely. that's like an important part of this that that yes. really stood out to me this time <clears throat> thank you dear i'm glad and sri ramakrishna is very adamant about that i'll say something can you hear me okay please yes love to hear from you tom so uh you, somewhere in there you mentioned the word effort yes uh, this has become one of the big questions for me uh is how much effort because it seems like there has to be a balance. There has to be effort, but if I try too hard, I get tense and it doesn't do any good at all. So there's a, a balance between enough effort and too much effort or trying and trying too hard. And I don't know that there's any clear answer to that. It's just sort of a balancing act within my own life of, but anyway, that's one of my sort of ongoing uh, challenges. Very good, Tom, and thank you for bringing that up. That impatience that leads to an excess of effort in a particular moment or time, that impatience is one of our desires. We want something that isn't in this present moment. And so we become impatient or frustrated. That in itself is a major impediment to moving on. Why? Because it disturbs the mind. As soon as the mind is not quiet, it is incapable of concentration. So this is, as we'll discuss as we go through the yamas and niyamas and so on, that the whole point is to reach a state where your body is calm, your mind is quiet, and you have control of your attention. 
And it is not, as we'll discuss, this is not a path that is of real appeal as a way of life for many, for very many people. Because it means organizing your life in a way that you can really pursue the first six limbs of Patanjali's yoga. <clears throat> and uh, you know, it means living a very different kind of life than uh, the ordinary human being, particularly the ordinary householder. Most Raja yogis are monastics, either nuns or monks. Uh, you can see them in all of the great spiritual traditions that have monasticism or its equivalent. Uh, Sufism has an equivalent, though they don't have formal monastic orders. Uh, certainly Catholicism, uh, the Church of England or Episcopalian tradition, and of course Sanatana Dharma or Hinduism uh, has these ways of being. But most people are not able to live a life uh, that is organized in such a way that they can not be impatient or frustrated, but simply uh, do the daily. But it happens to every one of us to get frustrated. Thank you, Tom. And that's a very key point. Radhishantra? Yes, please, dear. Good morning. Yes, good morning. Um, what you just said is exactly what has been hankering in my mind, that I look at the sea of all this spiritual journey and I find it too vast for me to cross. So what happens is I just stop at the bank, wet my feet, and just live on as honestly as I can. Well, what th there we can take great refuge in the avatars, the divine incarnations. What is it? What is said of each of the divine incarnations? They say it of themselves, and others say it of them. They have done everything for us. Jesus said, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I shall give you rest. My burden is easy. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. In other words, and he says, I have overcome the world, not for himself. He had nothing to gain. but for us. And of Sri Ramakrishna it is said, how great was thy sacrifice, freely choosing thy birth in this prison, our iron age, to unchain us and set us free. Refuge to all who have cast fame, fortune, and friends away. Without question thou shelterest us, and the world's great sea in its wrath seems shrunk to the puddle that fills a hoofprint in the clay. Hmm. Students would come to Swami Brahmananda when he was president of the order, the Ramakrishna order. And they would say, oh, we want to go away to the Himalayas and do severe austerities and so on. We want to live in the forests and the caves. And he says, no, no, you don't need to do all that. We have done all that for you. We have done all that for you. Just stay, do your daily routine as you've been taught. And this is why the Ramakrishna order swamis will tell you, if you've taken initiation, you've received instructions. Follow those instructions to the best of your ability and something will happen. Those instructions were given to 
this person. I did what I could and listened for years. Make me part of this became my prayer. He granted that, so it didn't end there. He made a new man, and he is now here. And that's what happens to us, slowly and slowly. This is over 50 years, 50 years. So anything else from anyone? Thank you, Vimla. That was Thank very you. sweet and very sincere. Hi, this is Marla. Yes, Marla. So from a, a very, maybe slightly different perspective, it's, it, it strikes me how much this fits in. I'm a Montessori teacher. Maria Montessori lived in India for a very long time. And so, of course, her, her method of education was obviously, you know, deeply influenced. But you know, the statement, you can't win if you don't play, is exactly, you know, what Montessori philosophy is about, that you have to get your hands dirty, you have to get in there, and you have to do things, you can't stand on the sidelines, and it is through action that one learns, not through just hearing, not through just, you know, observing, which there can be some, but really you have to, you know, get in there, and this idea of organizing one's life, one's environment, to support this is deeply held within Montessori as well that often if there's a problem we look to the environment and say is the environment set up for success very good dear excellent <laughs> setting up your environment for success is part of what a raja yogi does they organize their life and their priorities their environment in order to make it conducive and just what you said is so true I mean, you may want to play chess. You can read every chess book under the sun. You can watch others play chess. And you can hear them tell what they know about playing chess. But until you sit down and move that first pawn, you don't know anything about playing chess. You only know about chess. You don't know anything about playing chess. You'll notice that that image was used, those of you who received the newsletter, or saw the Facebook page and so on. That image was of chess was used as a metaphor for you can't win if you don't play. And I so, love the choice of the word play, because yes, games have rules, games have certain structure to them. But there's also <laughs> joy and enjoyment in the process as well. Yes, yes. That's what that's what Vivekananda says. Don't complain. The struggle is the poetry of life. And yes, there are rules. And we'll talk about them in a moment after we've, we've finished with any other comments or conversation that people want to have. Thank you, Marla. You're so right. Play means exactly that. There must be some joy in it. And of course, as far as Raja Yoga goes, the joy comes in the increasing sense of freedom, the increasing sense of happiness that comes with calmness of body, quietness of mind, and control of your attention. It has many, many practical and enjoyable benefits as well. You, it, the experience of listening to music is very different once you have control of your attention. For example, anyone else? I was just going to add, that's, as Jerry Brunner often has said, that's why they call it playing mu music. Playing right. music. Right, right. Yes, if it's a chore, what good is that? No, there must be some joy in it. There must be some joy in it. And there is. But there's also this effort. So anything else from anyone? This is wonderful. This is exactly why we're here, to study together. Just so I understand, by win, you mean attaining one of the samadhis, and by play, 
do you mean engaging in your sadhanas and meditation? Is that what's meant by play and win here? Win means that victory of, of achieving a lower form of samadhi, yes. Playing means doing the things necessary to achieve that state. And of course you're going to be dealing with well, this is what we'll talk about next week. Next week's title is One Dream, One Dreamer, Three Dreams. And we'll talk about uh, what it is you, you encounter as a Raja Yogi when you enter your inner awareness and the three levels that exist there that contain your waking awareness, your active subconscious, and your latent subconscious, all of which contain some scars that are active, whether we know it or not. Even the latent uh, subconscious is full of active some scars. Some of them are very difficult, and Holy Mother calls them knots of the heart, K-N-O-T-S, knots of the heart. We'll talk about that next week. But yes, you're dealing with your samskaras. You're learning what they are and how they manifest in your life and how they interrupt your attempt, attempts to maintain calmness, quietness, and control of your attention. Anything else? Thank you, Brahmadas. All right, let's talk about the first six limbs. We have uh, about 15 minutes left before we do our wind up. Uh, let's talk about the first six limbs of Patanjali's yoga and their purposes and their fruits. The first is yama. Yamas, the yamas, the restraints. What are these restraints? They are the restraints on our lower nature that leads us to be self-interested and see everything that happens in the world and to us in terms of our self-interest. It leads us to be crafty. It leads us to be uh, deceptive of others. It leads us to uh, trying to get more than we really should from a situation, uh, dharmically. In other words, we're taking more than is our share and therefore harming others in a subtle way. That we are harmful to others and ourselves, though we don't seem to know it at the time, because we are actively self-interested and see everything in terms of I, me, mine. So if you're going to restrain that, if you're going to restrain those tendencies, what will you, you, there must be some replacement. As Rumi remarks, no, is it Rumi? Well, one, I think it, I, no, I think it is, uh, well, it doesn't matter who said it. Uh, Tukaram. Tukaram said, uh, only a fool kicks a lover out of bed unless he knows he has two more and better on the way. In other words, why would you suppress your ego and what it's achieved for you unless there's something better? So the, what is the better? It is the niyamas, the observances, those things that lead to a higher frame of reference, a higher level of consciousness, where you're replacing I, me, mine with thee, thou, thy. <clears throat> and it's a, it's a system of observances, of purification, of study, of offering what you are and do to the divine presence, that slowly and slowly, as Patanjali says, replaces your lower samskaras, the active lower samskaras that you continue to nurture with your attention, with higher samskaras, still samskaras, still mental impressions, still experiences, but they're of a different, higher nature. 
And so you begin to water those with your attention, and those are what grow in you. Now, these aren't something that you do separately. You don't do the yamas, then then the yamas. No, you begin to replace I, me, mine with thee, thou, thine uh, together. And you also pursue the other four limbs of yoga together to the best of your ability. Your ability increases in time to be successful at the other four. The first is asana. Now, asana simply means posture. Uh, in Hatha Yoga, we have these complicated uh, series of asanas or postures that each have their own particular purpose, all of which are meant to calm the body, calm the mind, and gain poise and centeredness. All well and good. But as far as Patanjali is concerned, it simply means learning to sit still in a particular posture long enough that you can do the other aspects, that you can begin to practice the other aspects, the other limbs of you. So it means to sit still in a particular posture. That's what asana means in Patanjali's context. So the next is pranayama. A pranayama means, and we, we often think of it as breath control. That's, it, that's how it's translated into common speech, but that's not what it means. It means control of your life force. We have these so-called sheaths. The first is the anamaya kosha, the food body, the gross body. This is the one that is restless for <clears throat> and wants this, that, or the other thing for satisfaction of bodily needs. Then you have your pranamaya kosha, your life force body. So in doing this asana and pranayama, you're learning to control your life force. <clears throat> Certain breath exercises are ways to control that life force because breath life force and thought are all highly well they're just completely connected uh, you can study some neuro neuro anatomist like jill bolte taylor to find the details of just how much they are connected but the fact is this is what patanjali tells us that they are very much connected but the ramakrishna order swamis at least following Sri Ramakrishna's instructions, say don't emphasize these breath exercises because they require a very, very accomplished teacher for you to do them in a way that is not harmful to you. It's because of the age we live in. This is what Sri Ramakrishna says. In this age, we are so dependent on stimulation, on food, that uh, it's very difficult uh, to uh, to control your life force by uh, these breath exercises without risking damage to your nervous system. So what the Ramakrishna orders Swami say is pursue these others, the yamas and niyamas, and then <clears throat> Let pranayama come on its own, the control of the life force come on its own by practicing the next, which is pratyahara. Now, this is absolutely central. There's a reason that it's central in the, in the uh, order of these. Pratyahara means learning to ignore the demands of sense objects and uh, not only externally, learning to ignore uh, what your, is being picked up by your sense organs, but also your memory of uh, those, which leads to uh, reverie about pleasurable experiences or projection to, I want more of that kind of experience, sense experience. Learning to ignore 
the demands. This is part of that thing that Brahma Das was talking about when he said, your samskaras. When you begin to turn inside and you begin to encounter your samskaras, you'll see that there are many, many that are associated with things of the past or your imagination of the future that draw your attention and interrupt your ability to concentrate. So pratyahara, control of your uh, involvement with and attraction to the sense objects, both in your present environment and what you remember or imagine. So the next is dharana. Dharana. Dharana means, oh no, I'm sorry, dhyana. No, it is dharana. Dharana means concentration. Now that you have gained some control over your uh, self-centeredness, you've replaced it with higher centeredness, a centeredness in a higher way of being, and you've gained some control of your body <coughs> and your life force through these practices, now you can begin to really practice concentration. Concentration. So concentration was defined earlier. It begins with the ability to hold a single thought, image, sound, whatever it is, for 12 seconds, and transitions to meditation when that can go on for a little over two minutes. Very difficult to achieve, but not beyond any of our capabilities. It just depends on how long and how much we're willing to practice. The intensity of our practice is also involved and is mentioned by Patanjali, but that intensity of practice, that deep intensity of practice, can really only be achieved by someone who is living as a Raja Yogi and is doing these things as part of their, it is the majority of their daily existence. They do other things only to maintain that existence. Such work as they need to do, such uh, efforts outside of their immediate environment, and so on. So then the final of the six limbs is dhyana. Dhyana. Meditation. And when you are able to achieve meditation, when you're able to control your attention and hold it as one pointed for more than two minutes, then you enter an entirely new realm. And this is where <clears throat> you will experience these lower forms of samadhi. Now, don't despair. Oh, I can't do this because I can't organize my life that way. This is what is meant by what Jesus said, what Sri Ramakrishna said, and what Vivekananda said of both Jesus and Sri Ramakrishna, and for that matter, Krishna and Rama, and for that matter, Buddha. They have done what they, they did what they did so that they can share it with us. So that they can share it with us. And as it's said in the evening prayer to Sri Ramakrishna, we are equal before thy sight. We are equal before thy sight. There is no preference, no, it's not a meritocracy. So whatever it is that you wish, as, as all of the great teachers have said, ask. Ask me, and I will share it with you. So any comments or questions about these six limbs of yoga? Just to, just to quickly say, the final two are samadhi, the final samadhi, the 
samadhi without seed. That is to say that you've left behind the realm of desire and attachment. Why? Because you left behind the mind in which desire and attachment are part of the samskaras. You simply leave it behind. Now, what does that mean? I can't tell you. No one can tell you because there is no mind to tell you in that state. So that's nirvikalpa samadhi and it is it leads to full liberation, full independence, kaivalya. <clears throat> and as Patanjali says, it's no longer a matter of self-effort. At the end of the six limbs of yoga, then something happens to you. This is what Patanjali says. The first six limbs are something that you do. The last two, some this profound samadhi. And, and I say profound just as a way of gesturing at it. Profound samadhi and liberation are something that happens to you. So any comments from your own wisdom or experience? Any concerns that this raises or any questions you'd like to ask? Uh, Brother Shankara? Yes, dear. This is me right here. Um, my question was, uh, you explained very well the eight limbs. The last two limbs, do they happen because of just the grace of divine grace? Or is the self-effort all done by that stage? The self-effort is all done by that stage. But we can argue that the desire to pursue this at all is a manifestation of divine grace. That's what Swami Ranganathananda uh, argues in his talk that was made into that book, Divine Grace that it is divine grace that is pushing us along all the time. We don't know it, but emphatically, yes, it is grace that, uh, that, uh, that uh, takes us, uh, that, that, that produces this something happens to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And you no longer, you, when you're in that state where you've achieved these lower samadhis, as I said, your eye consciousness is now purified. It isn't as if you become disembodied. Uh, uh, you, you, you still have this eye consciousness, but it's not the same at all. You no longer have attachments and, and desires in the sense that you did before. It is, as Sri Ramakrishna said, a ripe eagle. It becomes like a shy child and retires to the shadows so that it's no longer troubling. This is the result of this path at the, at the end of the sixth, uh, the sixth limb of the yoga. Each of the paths achieves this state, but uh, this is the way Raja Yoga. Anything else from anyone? I'll say something uh, briefly connected with what you were just talking about. So I've had uh, problems with insomnia on and off all my life. And uh, a while back, I did something called CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for uh, insomnia. And one of the most use, it, it's basically, a, a lot of it is just changing your ideas. Uh, and one of the most useful things was the idea that sleep, falling asleep is not something you do. Falling asleep is something that happens to you. Yes. And if you just let go of that idea that, oh, I have to fall asleep, mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 it changes everything. And it's true. But I've, I've never been able to fall asleep as an act of will. Falling of course asleep no. <laughs> just happens to me. And it's yes. the same with any any type of uh, exper spiritual experience or awakening experience, liberation experience, whatever you want to call it. All of those experiences are not something that I've ever been able to do. 
there's something that just happens to me. Thank you, That's Tom. It. You're absolutely right. This is why it's said that if you do have, so to speak, trouble falling asleep, that you do something repetitive. Uh, count sheep, is, of course, is the old folk uh, medicine for it. Count sheep. Um, and soon you'll find you go to sleep. Well, uh, the Ramakrishna order Swamis say, well, it's, it's more productive for you if you say a mantra. Um, you know, again, this is something repetitive. It requires that you take your attention away from the act of falling asleep. And uh, as you say, pretty soon you're asleep and you don't know how or why or when. There is, well, that's all, that we'll talk about that next week in this one dream or three dreams. That there is, uh, you know, psychic control is possible, but dangerous, dangerous. Thank you, Tom. Yes, it's something that happens to us. Anything else from anyone? All right, I'm going to do our closing chant. Brother, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Oh, uh, brother, uh, today I just want to introduce one of our old time devotees. Uh, she is uh, Mamata Ji. Uh, she is living in Chattanooga. So she is 97 years old. So so she wants to speak something. She has come to our Atlanta center before, a long time back. She has met uh, Swami uh, Yogashananji Maharaj. So she can speak now. Jai Ma, please do speak, dear. You can speak now. Hello, Shankarananda Maharaj. I am I'm Mrs. Ghosh, Mamata Ghosh, Prabhash Ghosh from Chattanooga. Please accept my heartiest pranam. Well, dear, please, please know that all your love and concern is returned. Yes, I hope you remember me. Yes, and my of family. course. And I just want to pray for you that Ma and Thakur Swamiji will bless you to stay well and we can hear you talking and giving us all the beautiful speeches that we can observe, all of us, all together. God bless you and all your senses, everybody. Please accept my pronoun because Sundar is here and his wife is here. So I'm having a great time with them. I'm sending my pranam to you, okay? And as, to as I say, dear, you and your late husband are very much remembered. And uh, what, a, what a lovely and graceful thing it is that Sundar and Naranjana are doing with you. And uh, we're so glad that you visited with us this morning. And uh, of course, your blessings are powerful indeed. Uh, as it says in the Chandi, all women are your, uh, all, all women are your aspects, O Devi, with their various as aspects, with their various attributes. All women are your aspects, O Devi, with their various attributes. So Jai Ma, Jai Ma, Jai Ma Tati. Jai Ma, Jai Ma. Thank, thank you. you and thank, thank you, Sundar Niranjana, for bringing her to us and and uh, we we're so, we, we are so grateful to her for her presence and for her well wishes anything else from anyone okay om hari om let there be peace in outer space. Let there be peace in the sky, on the earth, and in the waters. 
let there be peace in the herbs, the plants, and the trees. May the gods be peaceful. May the whole universe be pervaded by peace. Let this infinite, universal peace prevail throughout my being. Om Shanti, 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 peace, peace, peace and beneficence be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. As Swami Vivekananda said, where shall we go to find God if not in our own hearts and in every living being? Anything else from anyone? All right. Any of you who would like to stay and uh, talk a little about Tom Couch, you're most welcome. But I'll close with what has become our, our spiritual, our, our, our interchange of energy at that united level. Jai Shri Guru Maharaj Ji Ki Jai Durga Durga Durga. May we be safe. May we be healthy. May we be cheerful. May we have peace of mind. May we be always in the loving and protective embrace of the divine being as our mother and father. Om Jai Ma Jai Ma Jai Ma Hari Om Tat Sat. <clears throat> so, any of you who would like to talk about Tom, please do uh, do have a, a say. I will just say that uh, Tom and I had become quite close during the last couple of years. Uh, he uh, his his life way and his spiritual. Uh, disciplines and spiritual practices over many, many years had led to a profound sweetness and a profound servicefulness that showed up in his work on our board and in his relationship with, uh, with people that, was, that he still wanted to be involved with here, including myself. <coughs> uh, he was a Christian by his his Ishta Devata was Christ. And so he had uh, for a number of years now been going to uh, St. Bartholomew's Episcopal Church here in Atlanta with his uh, wife Iris. And uh, I can tell you that the congregation at St. Bartholomew's will miss him greatly as well because his leadership became part of that congregation as well. And the memorial service for him will be held at St. Bartholomew's, not here, at Iris's request. And uh, she said, uh, she said, we're having him cremated. And the way she said it was so sweet, I'll keep him here with me until it's safe for us to have a memorial service and gather together in that way which she suspects will be sometime later this fall. So that's, that's what I know. Anything at all from anyone else? All right, dears. There were many, many. I think, I think Vimla was going to say something. Oh, okay. That's yeah, fine. no. What Brother Shankara said is so revealing of who he was and will stay with us. That's Thank one sanskara we should cherish, these loving. Oh, absolutely, people. indeed. Yes, indeed. Yes. These higher samskaras are to be cherished. Yes. They are the source of our, our real enjoyment in our day-to-day -day lives. Yeah, you know, when you do things extraordinary, being ordinary, 
staying humble and not, I think that that just is a very moving experience to meet someone like that. Yes, it certainly is. And Tom, without Iris, pretensions, without exaggerations, just a quiet flow of a stream of life. Yes, and sweetness. And sweetness. sweetness. Uh, the two of them had become quite a remarkable couple, uh, Tom and Iris. And uh, it's good that she has such a large extended family to surround her and uh, comfort her and support her and nourish her during this, this time. And she told me in personal conversation that she was going to insist on her ability to grieve for a year and uh, that she might even wear a black armband to remind people so that their impatience about, oh, just get over it. <laughs> you know, people I know. can be so unintentionally cruel. Yes. But uh, no, we need to cherish. We need to cherish life. Yes. And yeah. we need to cherish those who are grieving the death of a loved one. Because it is a very, very deep experience. And it goes on for years. The first year is the most intense, of course. But uh, this can testify that it, it really never stops. So I have a question in regards to that, the practical aspect of assisting Iris in her grieving. What would you suggest that we could do to help her? What ways can we support her? Marla, just give her a call and ask her. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm sure she'll be very grateful for the call and for the love, the expression of love and the expression of concern and the offer of service in whatever way it can be offered. I just have no idea what she has such a large extended family, not only her own family, but Tom's family. And they, they were all, uh, uh, many of them, were were present at Tom's death. They were actually in the ICU room with him when he died. I mean, this, these, this is being permitted these days. It's wonderful. And uh, <clears throat> so um, just what she will need, I don't yeah. think she'll need any material thing. I think she's well provided for in that way. But just what she might like, you know, she's a Montessori person herself. And uh, what that might mean in, her, in terms of her, an opening for her to participate in that way. That's the only thing that comes immediately to mind, Marla. You know, just, there might be something along that line. Just sort of a general thing that I've found over the years um, is that, especially someone like Iris, who has a lot of people around her right now, is that that happens where everyone comes in, you know, the, the near and dear, the close friends, all the way out to the acquaintances, and then everybody kind of forgets about it. Yes. So, you know, unless you're really close to her, if, if you're a friend, um, think about, you know, a few weeks out from now. Very nicely remarked. Yes. Yeah. That's what yeah. I'm thinking more of the after all of the family goes away and she's yeah. left alone. And I just, yeah, I'm a very practical person. So I'm already, you know, thinking about what, you know, just lit daily kind of supports like, you know, some food, you know, things like that to just help her um, just, just to, to comfort her. Well, yeah, one yeah. thing I know is that she plans to sell the house yeah. and, uh, and, uh, and so there'll be all of that and what anybody else can be helpful with, I have no idea. But uh, we all know what it means to make. I know how much I depended on my near and dear. And the, uh, when, when I uh, left that museum to Marjorie's and on my marriage of 47 years and, uh, and left there to come here, if it hadn't been for the assistance 
of uh, my loved ones and my friends. I couldn't have done it in any way that would have made sense. But because of their help, I was able. So uh, I have no idea what Iris will need in the way of uh, servicefulness uh, with regard to that. But I do know she plans to sell the house, move into something smaller and more manageable, <clears throat> and uh, and begin to organize a life that is meaningful to her as someone alone. And that'll probably, as I told her, and she was grateful, She at least she said, and I think she meant it, that she was grateful for me telling her that it's the first four months that are the hardest. Um, because you, it's simply not possible to think of your daily life without that person. I mean, they were together for 24 years and, and were uh, close for some years before that, before they got married. So it probably goes on something like, you know, somewhere between 28 and, and 30 years that they were, that they were, that they knew one another and were, were close. I think it was a while before they finally got married. So it's going to be a, a big adjustment, a big change. <clears throat> and the the moving, I think, it, fortunately, is something that she and Tom, last time I was over there was a few months ago at their house, and they told me they were going to sell their house and, and move into something much smaller. So this is a project they were already talking about and working on together. So yes. this is something she's like, oh, Tom's gone, I have to move. This is like a project they were working on together. So um, yeah, I think help help with that, an offer of, you know, help. But anyway. thank you, thank you, Marla, just for the expression of, of loving support for her. I know you know her and uh, so, uh, I'm sure she'll welcome uh, some sweet attention from you. Yeah, I was just holding back a little bit. Um, a friend of mine, Sarah, went and spoke to her. I just know times like this are so overwhelming. And mm -hmm. so I want to give her a little time. And then when things settle down, then, you know, reach out to her more. Well, as, as Cindy very uh, astutely remarked, it won't be so very many weeks before most of the people who gathered around her uh, have to go back to their own lives. I mean, they, 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 and uh, so pretty quickly, there'll be a very small group of people that is still uh, very actively involved. So who knows what, uh, what would be welcomed from someone outside that close inner circle. Anything else from anyone? Well, Brother Shankara, yes. I mean, I didn't know them that yes. well, but what we all can do is just pray and have hold good thoughts for Iris. And <coughs> as long as, you know, she for a year or whatever, you know. Her, uh, yes, you're absolutely. Uh, Swami Prabhavananda was absolutely adamant about the power of prayer. It's because we're not separate. As Swami Yogeshananda used to teach in Tom Tauch's remark, consciousness is primary and is not plural. It seems, but that's what Swami Prabhavananda would point out about the power of prayer. What? Do you think you are separate? No. Pray, pray. It has an effect. So you're absolutely right, Mira. You're absolutely right. Hello, this is Language Services or Session X. We have a call for Punjabi. This is a call for Punjabi. Okay, anything else from anyone? Okay, just this final thought, this final prayer. Om Hari Om. 
Uma Satoma Satkamaya, Tavasoma Jotir Gamaya, Mutyorma Amrutangamaya, Abir Abir Moiti. O dearly beloved, lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from this realm of relentless confusion to thine abode of silence, serenity, clarity, and peace. Lead us from darkness to light. Lead us from darkness and ignorance to the brilliance of thy wisdom and love. Lead us from death to immortality. Light us through and through. Light us through and through with thy everlasting, shining presence. Om Hari Om Tat Sat. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. O beloved Lord, make it so. Peace, peace, peace be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. <clears throat> so until tomorrow evening, for those of you who wish to join us for the Monday evening class, Monday evening we study the book Love Poems from God. Uh, on Tuesday we study the life of Holy Mother. And on Wednesday we study uh, and discuss, we discuss all of, all of these things. We study and discuss Swami Ranganathananda's divine grace. So until then, for all of you, any final thought from anyone? Shankara. Yes, um, I was just thinking, would you want to speak a little bit about Tom's involvement with AA and... Oh my goodness. Uh, I only know what he told me and what a couple of his friends from IA told me, but here's what Tom told me. And uh, he also mentioned it to Jillian, that AA had been the gateway to Vedanta for him. And he said, literally, literally a gateway, because it is the practical application of these great spiritual principles in, in, uh, in a very everyday kind of way. But when I said that over these last few years, Tom had become very sweet and very serviceable, one of the things that he did was increase the number of people for whom he was serving as a sponsor. Now, for those of you who don't know much about AA, being a sponsor is a 24 hour a day, seven day a week, 365 day is a year activity. You must be available to your sponsee whenever they call you, because the reason they call you is that they are in need. They are in need of you helping them to stop from taking a drink because they're being sorely tempted. They're in need of counsel about some particular uh, uh, situation in their life. They're in need of some guidance about how to pursue wherever they are in the 12 steps of AA. And of course, Tom, I, I don't recall now just how many years he had of sobriety in AA, but he was still going to meetings, <clears throat> still going to meetings, and still actively taking on sponsees. And I would be meeting with him, we would be having a conversation, and his phone would ring, and he got a better phone, just so that it would be more uh, immediately available. Uh, I mean, I, I know that. Uh, he told me that he'd gotten a better phone so that he would be more responsive. And the phone would ring and he'd look at it and he'd say, oh, I have to interrupt this. Uh, I have to go outside and talk with someone for a while. And I knew it was one of his sponsees. So Alcoholics Anonymous, for those of you who don't know much about it, is a very, very 
powerful uh, organization in the lives of literally millions and millions and millions of people. And it is without formal organizational structure. It doesn't cost you anything. I mean, it is the model for how practical spirituality can be offered uh, to someone, particularly to someone who's in deep distress and needs nothing more than the loving support of people who truly understand what they're going through. And that's what AA provides. And then there's the 12-step program, which if you study it, is just awesome. It is itself a spiritual path and a powerful one indeed. So when Tom said that, uh, that he came to Swami Yogeshananda because of his involvement in AA and that in, in his pursuit of AA, he developed some questions and through some friends, he found out about Swami Yogeshananda. And when Swami Yogeshananda was still living uh, in a small apartment on Sycamore Drive in Decatur, Tom went to see him and the Swami uh, offered him tea and cookies. And Tom came with a whole load of questions. And he said, as he drove away, he said, the Swami didn't answer any of the questions that I, he, that I asked, but he answered all of the questions that were deep and that I didn't want to admit to asking. He answered all those questions. And so right then and there, his loyalty to Swami and his admiration for his deep spiritual insight was formed. And it went on to be cemented to where Tom was absolutely loyal and committed to Swami Yogeshananda while he was alive and to what he had created after uh, the Swami would, left the body, left first left this place to retirement in South, Southern California, and then uh, <clears throat> left the body. Tom wanted that what the Swami had created and the momentum that he had provided to be maintained and was fiercely a guardian of it. Thank you, Lori. Anything else? Is there anything you'd like to add, Lori, from your knowledge of Tom? Uh, I don't, I, I don't think so. Okay. Um, but just, he, thought I'd, just thought I'd ask. Yeah. Thank you. But he really was a pillar of the center. Oh, no question. <laughs> I mean, another of them is Pranab Lahiri, who is exactly. only recently retired from the board. And uh, as you will see, Pranab wrote, a, if you read the newsletter, Pranab wrote a very loving uh, uh, tribute to, to uh, Tom. That is, that is what was published in this last week's newsletter. You can find the newsletter for those of you who don't uh, receive it automatically. Uh, you can find it on our Facebook page. Uh, just go to our Facebook page, which is a public open page. <clears throat> so you don't need to be a Facebook member. You can go there and you can uh, and, uh, and find our newsletter. And if you don't, if you're not able to, then just uh, email me and I'll forward you a copy.
Anything else from anyone, dears? Thanks so much, Shankara. Oh, you're more than welcome, dear. This is the great joy of being involved with this place, is sharing this life with you, sharing the life with all of you. I'll just say, um, <clears throat> I met Tom and Iris uh, in Al Anon meeting that we attended regularly quite a while. And then there were some years of being out of touch with him and started coming to the center. And one day after the, the service gathered in the, I think it was in the kitchen there. Um, I just started talking with Iris, not knowing who she was. And then I said, Iris, <laughs> right. like, I mean, you know me. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, uh, and then the other day your, your note came about Tom and I just like, oh God. Yes. Well, thank you for your very sweet response also, Eric. Yes. Uh, virtually everyone who knew Tom has some very, very powerful and fond memories. Oh, hey. Eric, by the way, it's good to see you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Anything at all from anyone else? All right. Well, we'll sign off. Uh, uh, all of this, of course, all this stuff that was discussed today will be in the, uh, along with the recording of the talk, it will be on the uh, YouTube channel and uh, the, uh, the, the talk notes will be there and downloadable if you want any, any of the specifics that were discussed. Okay, until next time, dear hearts, uh, much love, uh, much concern for your welfare. May you be well and in bright spirits. Uh, talk with you again soon. And away we go. <laughs> <laughs>